It changed uh, our experiences already for a long time, and it is also nice to have communications between research institutes and even students. When thinking worldwide, uh, cervical cancer is still an issue, so that uh, estimated number of cases more than half a million and also number of deaths is rather large compared to incidence cases. And uh, one aspect is that uh, the incidence or even death from cervical cancer can occur at rather young age uh, if preventive programs are not active. Most of the global burden is still in countries with rather low resources or uh, uh, medium resources as well. And what is interesting that there is very remarkable difference in the mortality, particularly the mortality rate estimates in low versus very high um, developmental index countries. And this difference is largely, largely explained by uh, availability of prevention programs. Um, and looking to predictions, uh, if uh, no further prevention could be implemented so that there is a background incidence as well as that could be growing and also population is aging, so meaning that in global terms the disease burden would increase. These are estimates for Europe. There is around uh, 60,000 new cases per year estimated and 25,000 deaths. Historically, um, there have been uh, quite similar risks in the different parts of Europe, but uh, prevention programs in western, southern and northern uh, regions have already decreased the incidence remarkably. Whereas mainly in Central and Eastern Europe, there is not yet similar uh, decrease available. When thinking optimal services by current services, uh, I think that the mortalities could still be remarkably decreased, maybe around half of the level that are nowadays and uh, seen even in these well-developed countries and even much more in these countries with less, less active programs. This is one example, a demonstration what can happen and what has happened in the cervical cancer mortality rates. Countries with huge volumes of testing with no eventual decrease, historical decrease in cervical cancer mortality, whereas there are also countries that have demonstrated nice results in prevention already a long time ago. It is not, this difference is not only of the activity or coverage of screening. These are just of those examples of various screening policies that had been adopted around in those times that the trends described. For instance, in Slovakia, there was still a policy of annual testing starting at a young age. And then there was no population-based screening and the screening tests were not validated at all. Whereas in Finland or Netherlands, for instance, there was a rather small number of tests lifetime. So generally, these well to two countries recommended from 7 to 15 tests per lifetime to, to make the difference. And um, like, um, if we would go further examples from Finland, so that the screening programs had been started already around 1960. After starting screening alone, so there was really remarkable de decrease in the incidence, particularly in the main target age of the program that was 
40 to 59. And then later on, when screening expanded to, to older women and also the population grew older, the same impacts started to be seen in older populations. In young people, there was never very clear decrease in cervical cancer incidence because of screening. So that in women 20 to 29, no decrease, and then 30 to 39, particularly 35 to 39, some decrease. Since mid-1990s, the incidence, particularly in young people, has increased, even though there is very high intensity of pap smear testing in this population. And this is one indication of increase in the background risk. On the other hand, mortality rates from cervical cancer also in young people in our country have remained stable. This is another demonstration what screening can do in cancer statistics so that coming trends from four Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Finland Norway and Sweden, that introduced screening around the same time, but Norway introduced much later, so that there is similar demonstration of huge impacts. And in Norway, uh, the, uh, the impact became a little bit later and not necessarily yet there in the same level uh, compared uh, in the historical decrease in other countries. So what are then the factors that can affect so tremendously on cervical cancer burden? I think that when looking to Nordic countries, it is the message that even the well-organized screening and systematic treatment of precancers and cancers and screening, particularly with the validated methods, and pretty good quality, it uh, it has affected and it can affect. So that uh, most of the historical uh, decrease has become from cytology screening with Papa Nicola staining methods, standard methods. Nowadays also corresponding li liquid-based cytology is used with similar, around similar effectiveness, and there is increased amounts of primary validated HPV test used. Like in our program in 2019, about 50% of the primary tests are already HPV tests in, instead of primary cytology. So that we can think that starting from screening so that these are the three options nowadays that are available. And then there is sure need also to validate new tests, other primary tests and particularly markers that indicate need of treatment in those who have HPV test positive. Another issue is this background risk. Even in Nordic countries, we have wide differences in the background risk and sure that there are differences related to HPV prevalence that we don't understand very well yet. So that, for instance, the sexual life, if parameters are pretty similar between the countries and still there can be remarkable changes in HPV burden. Um, HIV is an important factor, not in the Nordic countries. And tobacco smoking, we should not forget as a risk factor, particularly in rather young people. What is interesting that uh, even though the Nordic countries have introduced already HPV vaccine, vaccination starting 2008 in Denmark and uh, 2013 in Finland, um, these routine vaccination programs have not yet affected widely on the cervical cancer burden. There are validation and uh, research ongoing or effectiveness studies like in Denmark those first bird cohorts with extremely high vaccine coverage have now come to the youngest target age of cancer screening. And so that this evaluation of what is happening in their screening behavior, screening findings is ongoing. And we think that this kind of evaluation is very important to substitute the information that is largely obtained by modeling. And uh, for these vaccines, I should say that also 
time is here a very important aspect because uh, those bird cohorts that have been vaccinated have not yet grown very old, but in 10 years the situation will change completely when, when these vaccinated cohorts will grow up to age 35. It is really straightforward then to measure the benefits and harms in the vaccination populations that can affect still a lot to information and also understanding in the populations. Why these screening programs have uh, failed? I think that the main issue is that uh, uh, there is still a lack of providing appropriate service in the population. So that uh, even in some countries that don't invite systematically with a good practice, there is still overuse of services in large part of the population and then large part of the population is completely underscreened. Uh, it is good information to population, but also the medical personnel is, that is the key. Often the medical personnel is not really complying to the guidelines, for instance, and can suggest screening methods or screening policies that are against the guidelines. In this sense, one key is really to also take care of a good training and continuous training of personnel that meets with people and, and target population. In many countries, there have been use of non-validated cytology staining. For instance, we made uh, together with the ARC uh, and WHO Europe and, uh, and uh, uh, Belarus uh, Ministry of Health an extensive assessment of screening in Belarus uh, that was published already almost 10 years ago and it was evident that the coverage of testing was extremely high but the country used such staining methods that were not able to diagnose such precancers that would lead to cancer so that there was no impact on cancer burden because of that so that in these situations it is a very serious thing to think how this problem can be corrected. There can be management errors in diagnostic confirmation, drop out from treatments that are common if the service is not organized right and also optimal treatment of cancer is not always available. So thinking of this quality assurance guidelines and the main message is that, after all, this is so simple that you take care of good coverage and then standard protocols, validated protocols in those who have participated, and then you have to monitor to the auditing, quality assurance linkages, and so on. And then you can verify to the population everything is right. and. And if quality improvements indicated, then you have tools to run it. Going then to the future, uh, this is very easy to talk as there is this global strategy that extends already for 100 years from now. Uh, and uh, targeting very high coverage of vaccines in young girls pretty high coverage of screening with in the fully vaccinated cohorts. This means screening sometime far away in the future. This is not screening in unvaccinated. And then also guaranteeing treatment of both precancers and cancers. This is really an uh, interesting strategy and interesting to see what will follow uh, from this uh, consultation with member states. But it, it is also very challenging. It is good to understand that what is the basics behind this, but uh, the implementation of vaccination program, for instance, in this respect may be pretty challenging in a number of countries. But at least there is a good picture where to go. So, just to conclude my talk, uh, 
There are some keys to prevention, systematic screening, quality assurance at all levels, population-based vaccination, and also intensive control of tobacco smoking. So that these WHO targets are really demanding for a number of countries to get satisfied uh, even in the 10 year window. And uh, so also alternative strategies are needed to reach the target to eliminate cervical cancer. For instance, in our country, screening alone does not eliminate the cancer with such a definitions, but we need also vaccination and then the joint effect is likely to lead to much lower incidence and mortality burden than, than is requested by this uh, global target. Uh, how we can then improve the implementation? We need really legal frameworks and formal governance structures that support population-based programs that, that in a way bring uh, mutual understanding and consent for evidence-based policies and also consent for organizing services. We need quality assurance guidelines, monitoring, legislators for data linkages, for instance, standardization of indicators, and that is largely lacking still globally. Uh, and then also evaluated primary prevention interventions on tobacco smoking. Uh, we need validation, uh, novel methods and implementing them, and extensive training needs, particularly in those countries who don't yet use the validated methods. More focus on health inequalities, and uh, so uh, somehow we should plan a completely new set of implementation research. So it is not necessarily a question of medical uh, technologies, but how we adopt the technologies within populations, that is the key in the implementation research. And this could be also one strategy to close the gap between the recommendations and actual policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arti, for keeping the time so nicely. So this allows us a lot of discussion. We have five minutes, in fact, for, for discussion for this presentation. Are there any first comments from the floor? Can I ask you a question? Thank you for a very nice presentation, very useful presentation, I would say. You demonstrated uh, in uh, one of your slide increase in incidence in certain age group. I haven't seen it. Uh, how do you explain it? I mean, uh, uh, Finland has achieved with screening the most success. I think so. probably Finland is the most successful country which achieved a decrease in incidence and mortality from cervical cancer. How do you explain this uh, increase which you have uh, demonstrated? Thank you. Yes, in Finland there is increase in incidence uh, starting from late 1990s for instance, in the age group 20 to 29, where you have never seen screening impact. So it is likely that this increase in the incidence is because of increased background risk, so that the prevalence of um, oncogenic HPV types has increased over time. Then also tobacco smoking in young women has increased. So that this, this largely explains this this in incidence. And in, then the problem is that in young women, if the background risk increases, then screening does not take out this increase in the risk. So our strategy is therefore not to increase any more intensity of screening that is already very high in, in these younger age groups contracting cancer. But we have to wait and analyze carefully what happens when the vaccinated birth cohorts will grow up to cancer age. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, the Rolando, please. No, just if, may, if maybe you, <clears throat> sorry, you could make a comment about the status of in, uh, the use of HPV testing in Finland for, for screening. <laughs> yeah. What's the progress? Yeah, we have, um, 
such a national uh, guideline so that it is either primary cytology or primary HP test are both acceptable methods and then regions in principle decide. So that about uh, half of the regions are nowadays in primary HPV testing based on the European protocols are based on the European guidelines published in 2015 and about another half is in still primary cytology. Um, in our country the impact from primary cytology is extremely good so that it is better than in most countries and there is the reason that historically it just occurred that Finnish cytopathologists and gynecologists, they were trained by Professor Papa Nicola himself in states very carefully long period of time. And it happened that the criteria and working models with multidisciplinary teams were there from the beginning. And that's the reason that we don't expect similar uh, patterns after introduction of primary screening than in most other countries, so that in our country, the burden of CN lesions is very low compared to decrease in the incidence of cancer. So that we, it is possible that with primary HP testing, the burden of CN lesions will increase. And, and the impact that the primary HPV testing could still improve the cervical cancer prevention, the impact is rather small that is there available. It is still very useful to study and evaluate carefully and, and uh, I think that in the near future the, also the rest of the municipalities will still go to primary HPV testing. But where you do HPV testing, is it there is a triage with cytology or how does it happen? <laughs> triage with cytology and now we, uh, we would like to launch also studies on assessing other markers. For instance, dual staining, I think it is very easy to validate because the expectation of uh, sensitivity is pretty good compared with primary HPV test. So that you could do possibly validation studies already using cross-sectional CN2+. Plus. Uh, but for many other markers, the problem with the validation of trias markers is that you need really long-term follow-up to see what happens then in your main outcomes of the program program that you, you cannot expect uh, 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 complete uh, completely good results in the triage phase for instance hpv typing the information on typing any types is not completely matching with the progression probabilities of the diseases or diagnostic aspects that we have in histopathology and, and uh, and this validation of the triage markers is complicated. Thank you very much, Arti, for.